Hi, my name is Carl Wilkins from World Outside My Shoes, and my wife Teresa and I had the privilege of making our home in Rwanda, Central Africa, from 1990 to 96. Basically, we were partnering with the people of Rwanda to build schools, operate clinics, just try to somehow make life better. We were there for four years before this horrific event that's now known as the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis was launched. Really what's going to happen on April 7, 1994, after the president's plane is shot down the night before, a group of extremists are going to launch a coup d'etat. And, and their first item of agenda is going to be eliminate the opposition, anybody who's against us. They will launch one of the most efficient, quickest genocides of the last century. And, and this is not a story of one group of people hating another group because they married each other all the time. They worked together, played soccer together. This is really a story of, of men and women greedy for power, masterfully manipulating people to actually see the enemy in their, in their neighbor. Um, just to get kind of a big picture, that Thursday, you know, the coup is launched. Um, the genocide is launched. The, the prime minister is killed, not because she's of the minority, but she's not one of the extremists. And then these 10 Belgian UN soldiers will also be killed. A very strategic move to get rid of the 2,500 UN soldiers who were already in the country, kind of given the country the message, the world is with you. They will, they will get rid of almost all of those UN soldiers, and with the UN soldiers will also go nearly all of the foreigners. Now this is Thursday, huh? That night, a gang comes to the gate of our house. We know nothing of it. We're putting our kids to bed in the hallway, trying to put as many brick walls between them and the bullets flying as possible. We won't know until the next morning that this group of ladies is literally arguing for or pleading for our lives. And I've often tried to figure out, how did they, how did they do that? And I found some answers in the way the brain works. Most of us are familiar with the fight, flight, you know, freeze part of the brain down there. The amygdala or what, or what Dan Siegel calls the downstairs brain. Or the prefrontal cortex, the upstairs, you know, where, where creativity, logic, empathy, where those things reside. Now, when we're triggered and we're in our downstairs brain, and I think you can pretty much agree, these guys who are attacking our house are probably in their downstairs brain, you can't appeal to logic or empathy, you know? How are you gonna get through to somebody like that? And our neighbor ladies choose, I think, one of the most powerful weapons there is, stories. Stories about our family doing little acts of kindness, about our kids playing with their kids. Somehow they pierce the fog of this downstairs brain, at least for the leader, and they get through, and whether it is logic or empathy, I don't know but they turn this gang aside. That's Thursday night. Friday, the American embassy is saying, we're all leaving, everybody out. We're gonna evacuate, nobody, ambassador, nobody staying behind. They actually give us two orders. First order, we're all to leave. Second order, don't bring any Rwandans. Now, we had this young lady who lived and worked in our home, loved on our kids, she's like family. And this young man who came in the evening as the watchman, it's kind of like, we didn't know him quite as well, but it's kind of like she was immediate family and he was extended family. And they're telling us they are of the minority. They're the ones marked for the Tutsis, marked for extermination. And they're telling us we're supposed to leave part of our family behind, which we just, we can't imagine doing that. My wife and I have been in Africa for more than 10 years at this point. We had experienced incredible kindness, generosity, privilege at the hands of, of each of the, the home, you know, in the homes of all of the different people in the countries we worked in. We thought maybe now we might be able to use that privilege to, to at least help these two people in our house. And so my wife, my mom and dad will take the kids to safety and I'll stay hoping to make a difference for at least these two people. Um, in my house will be the young man, the young lady, and a pastor and his wife who will also join me during this time. We'll be, we'll be stuck in our home for the first three weeks, 24-7 curfew. You look at our kids as they were leaving, they don't look terrified. You say, were you scared? Lisa here on the, with the purple pants, she'll say, no, why not? Because mom wasn't scared. There's so many parts of this story to unpack, but man, 
the courage of my wife, her ability to trust and to love enough to let go, still just blows me away. One morning after three weeks, I'm having a conversation with a pastor. I'm like, I'm so glad we're still all alive and we're surviving, but there's got to be more. And he'll say, well, if you're going to do anything outside the house, you've got to build a relationship with the people in power. And so I will go to the government building, the headquarters. I'll meet the colonel in charge of the city, basically in charge of the genocide there. I'll tell them I'm here, I want to help. And they'll be trying to put forth the idea that this is just a war, you know, they're not talking genocide. And he'll give me a travel permit. He'll actually tell me about a couple of orphanages. He'll send his social affairs guy. You can help these orphans, he'll say. And so for the three months of the genocide, I'll be doing my best to work with my Rwandan colleagues to bring food, water, and medicine during this horrible horrible time, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. There's so many stories I could go into, which I won't right now today, but I just wanted to, I wanted to introduce you to the story. I wanted to also acknowledge the courage and the bravery. You know, sometimes kids are asking me, did you ever feel like giving up during those three months? I mean, more than a million people killed and you see this going on all around you. Yeah, you felt like giving up or discouraged, but I always like to say courage is contagious. My wife infected me. You know, my colleagues infected me. Damas and his wife Beatrice at at Kasimba Orphanage, they infected me. You know, you're never, the thing that's really hard is when you think you're alone. And that's when you feel like giving up, but I was never alone. We had um, just incredible bonds that developed during that time um, in our efforts to to just do what we could with, with what, was, what was at hand. I have to tell you one short story and quick story about my friend Gasiqua, the, the, one of my colleagues who was helping us build schools and stuff. He had more than 40 people in his home. And, and when they came to kill the people in his home, he literally greeted the guys with chickens. I mean, I see killers, he sees neighbors, he sees fathers. He treats them with respect, with empathy, with inclusion, and he's like, your kids must be hungry, huh? You, you want some chickens? It's to me another powerful example of, of, of getting somebody out of, their, out of their downstairs brain into their upstairs brain. There were so many stories of courage like Gasiquas, of, of the nurse at the orphanage who was not only treating the kids who had seen their parents killed, she's, she's trying to treat them, I mean, with their diarrhea or their nightmares but they're also bringing, those who are doing the killing are bringing their wounded friends to her. Damas, the director of the orphanage, he's just trying to help neighbors understand this is not who we are, you know? We are, we are not here to kill one another. After the genocide, he'll actually become a gachacha judge, these community courts. Trifine, sadly, will be killed during the genocide. I had no idea if she was Hutu or Tutsi. But I feel like she treated everybody with this, with this innate dignity. She treated everybody like they were, they were her, own, her own kids. This horrible time will come to an end after three months when the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the Rwandan Patriotic Army, led by then General Kagame, mostly refugees, Rwandans who were in exile, will come and, and, and they will pick up their guns again after three years of fighting to come home, thinking there was going to be peace. They'll lay down their guns. The genocide will be launched. These courageous men and women will end the genocide, and it'll be up to them to begin to rebuild this country. Um, The other day, I stuck my family photo on the same slide with this one because obviously their ending of the genocide was epic for the whole world, I mean, for all the people in Rwanda. But for my wife and, and, and children, um, this was huge for us. I didn't know if I'd ever see my, if I'd ever see my family again. And, and so I've just got huge gratitude to the Rwandan Patriotic Front, to General Kagame, now President Kagame, for ending this thing that many people kind of just skip over like it ended like a storm. No, people who've committed genocide have stayed in power. And, and this, is, this is a very different story. Thank you so much.